Thank you very much. Uh, I've got my phone as a timing device, not because I'm expecting a call, I should say. Um, OK, so my talk uh, this evening is uh, on five moments in refugee law. And the objective is to sort of capture five significant moments where um, there was a dramatic development in, in refugee law. My original vision was to kind of have moments where history truly swung on a hinge, as when um, King Leonidas and his Spartans held the Thermopylae Pass for an extra day and bought time for Greek civilization to, you know, to survive. Or perhaps when, King Constant when the Emperor Constantine had his revelation at the Milvian Bridge, which led to the survival of the Roman Empire in a particular form. Truth to be told, yeah, not every one of my five moments is quite as dramatic or uh, momentous as perhaps uh, those historic moments. But that was the sort of notion I was trying to uh, capture. Um, inevitably, so sadly, uh, the way things are going in the modern milieu, um, <laughs> the direction of travel is slightly pessimistic, and there's really not a lot we can do about that, obviously. Logically, I've had to replace one of my uh, planned moments with uh, events happening over this summer with the current legislative uh, movements in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Anyway, so first moment, the first moment, the low standard of proof, its rise and fall, or we might call it so-called low standard of proof. Standard of proof is one of those issues that is of great significance to the common law tradition, though one could probably conduct this lecture in theatres around the world in the civil jurisdictions, and they would hardly be concerned at all about the standard of proof. It's very much a, an artefact, an obsession of the common law. But it is nevertheless a convenient tool, uh, certainly for judges and, in theory, other decision makers, by which to uh, locate and identify a positive platform of facts upon which to make prognostications as to future risk in the asylum context. Obviously, standards of proof operate across the whole of the common law. And, and, common, and, and um, standard of proof has been a, a rich source of controversy for years and years and years. The Supreme Court in the last decade uh, repeatedly told off other judges for not getting the memo, uh, which there was in English law in general, outside of the criminal jurisdiction, only one standard of proof. There was a time where it was said the standard of proof varied depending on the gravity of the issues being determined. And in fact, that, you know, that has been corrected, that view, that misnomer has been corrected in a series of decisions with um, Ray B and Ray D at their apex. So standard of proof you know, is, is an area of some controversy um, in, in, in UK law generally, and that's obviously not going to get any better because the matter's been put firmly in issue by section, is it 32, of the, of the 22 Act. Anyway, the history of the uh, debate over the standard of proof um, in this country has some lineage. So going right back to 1985, um, Mr Justice Jonah in... Uh, no, not, not at all. In the case of Jonah, <laughs> um, we have a ruling that the standard of proof for the assessment of historic facts was the bound to probabilities. Now, the ground was then pulled away from under the feet of that ruling because a few years later, two years later, in Siva Kumaran, uh, we have the decision that when assessing risks in an asylum claim, the overall standard of proof is to be equated with that in extradition proceedings and is to be the reasonable degree of likelihood, substantial grounds for thinking, the real chance, etc., etc. So the next event uh, of, of significance after Siva Kumaran was that now faced with the proposition that the standard of proof for fact finding was a balance of probabilities, but that for risk measurement was a, a lower standard of proof, it was necessary to consider whether or not that was a logical way about, of going about things. And again, I, I keep saying this is controversial, this split the tribunal for a significant period, the various divisions of the um, Immigration Appeal Tribunal, as it then was, uh, you know, debated this issue. And, and indeed, I remember Scottish QC refusing to follow uh, decisions that were supposed to be binding. Um, and eventually they, they convened a panel of uh, interested uh, Vice Chairman, Mr Madison, Professor Jackson, and uh, I suppose it would have been a lay member, possibly Mr, Mr. Kumar. Anyway, so this, this, channel, this, this, this panel sat and they cogitated upon the issues and they decided that logically there could only be a single standard of proof for risk assessment and the assessment of future risks. That was the upshot of their, of, of their thinking. And they said that um, it should be anathema in the asylum regime to separate out past events from establishing the risk in the future. There was a probability in an asylum claim of greater than normal uncertainty when considering the historical facts. It would be a rare decision maker who was never uncertain about some aspects of the evidence. <laughs> 
And that was a majority decision. I say even, you know, this, this, even this panel split, and Mr Madison, he wrote, there is no reason on a common sense basis or in law the burden of proof should be any lower than the normal civil standard. The appellant is simply required to tell the truth. And so it was that, you know, for some years, the Carja Tribunal, the majority uh, approach, held sway. And an interesting feature of it is that although we all very glibly refer these days to the low standard of proof, um, query whether we are right to do so. As was pointed out in the landmark decision that was to follow, Karen Akron, Carja never themselves, that tribunal never said that there is a low standard of proof for historic fact-finding. All they said was that there should be a positive role for uncertainty. They never said the balance of probabilities should not apply to asylum fact-finding. Uh, and that, that may be something that we come to hear more of as the standard of proof is litigated in the years to come. Anyway, the next event um, pro in, in between uh, Carja and Karen Akron is the decision of Horvath. Horvath is a case about the Roma community from Eastern Europe and the problems they had at the hands of the skinhead population and their allies in the local police forces. Um, and so that was a case about state protection primarily. But beyond that, uh, it prompted some musings by the Court of Appeal, Stuart Smith and Ward, Lord Justices, um, about the standard of proof for measuring historic facts. And they put the matter firmly in issue. And they said that, uh, in their opinion, the standard of proof should probably be the balance of probabilities, but the matter wasn't live in front of them, and they thought the Court of Appeal should consider the issue at the earliest possible opportunity. I apprehend they had in mind that they would be considering it. <laughs> but little did they know that the day before they handed down their judgment, the court, said Lee Brooke and someone else, uh, had risen in the, in, in, in the internal relocation case of Karen Akron. And they recalled the advocates in order to beat the Conservative wing of the Court of Appeal to the jaw in terms of giving a ruling on what the standard proof should be for eons to come, they hoped. Uh, as they put it, we ought to take this early opportunity to resolve the issue. And as I'm sure they would be the first to acknowledge, we have had the benefit of very much fuller argument on all these issues than was available to the Horvath Court. And so they go on and they quote a series of hugely insightful decisions, Gao, Wu Shang Lang, um, others, other decisions, uh, Raja Lingham from the Australian court, which, which managed to make even more of a meal of standard approval in asylum than the English courts ever did. You know, perhaps nine or ten major precedent decisions fell from the Australian court over the course of a decade. And the learning that um, they handed down was this, that there should be a positive role for uncertainty, that the risk of error given the gravity of issues involved, should always be acknowledged. And really, um, possibility should only be discounted when assessing fears of persecution if one was in no real doubt that they were rightly to be rejected. They also said that civil litigation was an inap inapt analogy. And this is something that the English judges, Brooke and Sedley, ran with very much. They said that, um, you know, that, that the asylum forum is not, it, it, it's not an adversarial process in the normal sense. It's not a trial between equal parties, essentially an asylum appeal, one side puts up a case and the other tries to knock it down, but with no affirmative evidence of their own most of the time at all. So they said that civil litigation was an inapt analogy. So the conclusions then in Karen Akron, learning, drawing on the Australian uh, learning, was that decision makers weren't constrained by rules of evidence uh, in civil litigation. Um, decision makers shouldn't, fire, shouldn't feel obliged to find certain facts as proved. They shouldn't exclude any matters of consideration when assessing the future. And only at the last moment is a residual balance of probabilities test applied, even in most other forms of litigation. Anyway, then we have the statutory intervention in uh, Section 32 of the 22 Act, which introduces that thing, the very heresy that was identified in Carja, the two-stage test. That's, you know, that, that has been uh, firmly uh, brought onto the statute book now. And indeed, the worst of it, in a sense, is not simply the adoption of the balance of probabilities, but the insistence of a two-stage test. Because if all we had was balance, balance of probabilities alone, all that rich Australian learning and the contributions from Sedley Brook and Jackson, well, all that material would be available for us to freely draw upon 
whatever the label attached to the standard of proof overall. It's the compartmentalization, the partitioning into two parts, which is a real uh, vice, critics would say, of Section 32. And so what Section 32 says is that when assessing um, fear and whether or not someone has a characteristic causing them to fear persecution, the balance of probabilities is to be adopted. And when determining risk and internal relocation, um, the low standard of proof, uncontroversially, is to be adopted. But a caveat to all this, and obviously no doubt this will be the subject of litigation to come, an interesting caveat is the UK VI guidance, as, as published, I think remarkably, still version one, um, not tinkered with over a full nine months, I think, um, on, on assessing credibility. And it says, and this is post-22 Act cases, you must consider whether to apply the benefit of the doubt to any material facts which remain in doubt after you have reviewed all the evidence in the round. So it seems that remarkably, whatever they may have achieved by legislation, um, some minds at the Home Office uh, still want to enshrine the Karja and Karen Akron approach by the back door of guidance, and you know, long may that guidance survive. A final point before moving on to my next topic, my topics probably get shorter as they go on if you're watching the clock, um, is that the, um, the richness of the common law, yeah, judges always waffle on about the richness of the common law. Um, I looked for a reference of it. In fact, I drowned in references, in fact, if you get speaking of the richness of the common law on Bailey. Um, and you know, one example, you, know, you, you read the dead language of Section 32 of the 22 Act, <laughs> compared to the, you know, the richness of the consideration by the multiple divisions of the Tribunal Court of Appeal and Australian judges who looked at the issue. And you know, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a sad comparison, really. Um, and the moment at which one division of the Court of Appeal swoops to take the legal morsel out of the mouth of another, activist lawyers, you tell me. Next topic, second moment, persecution and human rights, the moment at which uh, English law possibly turned its back on the full majesty of the human rights approach to assessing persecution. So long ago, and in fact it was the same decision upon which we've already touched, Jonah, back in 1985, in the days where there really was hardly any epistemology around refugee law, save for the UNHR handbook, Professor Hathaway's book, and one or two bits of case law, um, back in the days of Jonah, that decision not only dealt with standard of proof, but also looked at the question of a definition of persecution, and it said that persecution was an ordinary word in the English language, and therefore the dictionary def definition should be adopted to pursue with malignancy or injurious action to oppress for holding a heretical opinion or belief. Um, and before too long, uh, we, we've just met, we've already met David Jackson, who's the author of the Carja decision, possibly English law's first great refugee law judge, now we meet the second one, Geoffrey Kerr. And Geoffrey Kerr was responsible for the decision in Gashi, which was a response to the very large numbers of asylum claims emanating from the former Yugoslavia, from Kosovan nationals um, seeking asylum in the UK. And it was decided that uh, a, a test case was needed, a kind of uh, general ruling was going to be needed in order to deal with all these cases, or you know, set down some form of precedent uh, in one go. Geoffrey Kerr, I have to say, at the venerable age of 94, graced the stage at the conference in The Hague of the International Association of Refugee Judges last week, 94, and also, in the same month, published his new book on refugee law, The Galilee Bell, dealing with church asylum. So his great contribution, anyway, in the case of Gashi, uh, was that the preamble of the Refugee Convention was an important star by which to navigate. Uh, and the preamble says that considering the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, too, has affirmed the principle that human beings shall enjoy fundamental rights and freedoms without discrimination. And so, given that preambular intention clearly stated in the recitals to the Refugee Convention, Mr. Kerr said that um, that was a green light, a green light to adopt a human rights approach rather than a dictionary definition approach to the, calcula to, to the calculation of persecution. And indeed, he went further. He adopted um, Professor Hathaway's three categories, or maybe even four categories, of, of, of varying forms of human rights, which, depending on their legal foundations in the international law of human rights, had various forces to them. So first category rights were those which were completely inviolable. Second category rights were those which were de derogable in times of emergency. Third category rights were those which should be um, uh, 
implemented in a non-discriminatory way, but were otherwise uh, okay to violate. Okay, so that was Gashi, and for some time, you know, Gashi held sway, and indeed, surprisingly, surprisingly, um, you know, effectively approved by the Horvath litigation, the Seppert and Bulbul litigation, um, and so things stood right up to the time when we entered the L'Espace Juridique of the um, European Union's Common European Asylum System, and the Qualification Directive entered force. And we say more, I'll be saying more about the Qualification Directive era in due course, but for now, we're just looking at the issue of persecution. And the QD then, it says that it, it, at Article 9, it addresses it addresses uh, the issue of persecution, and it does so in two stages. 9.1 deals with gravity. Acts of persecution must be sufficiently serious by their nature or repetition to be a severe violation of basic human rights, in particular those which derogation can't be made, or B, can be an accumulation of various measures. So 9.1 deals with, or, or, sorry, of equivalent severity. So 9.1 deals with gravity, 9.2 deals with examples, and it gives examples such as discriminatory prosecution, discriminatory um, sentencing, military service in breach of international norms as a species of conduct which could uh, be seen as persecution. English law then, in due course, looked at uh, the meaning of those provisions in order to decide whether or not the Gashi approach still survived. And it did so in the cases of those who we might style the Palestinian three, M-A-M-T and S-H, Palestinian territories, three cases which made their way through the court at a very similar time and represented you know, a, an early effort by the UK courts to deal with the difficulties posed by um, the Palestinian issue. And in these cases, there were two factual issues largely in play, yeah? One issue was the possibility of a getting back into one's homeland. And secondly, was the question of how bad would the discrimination be once one was there? And to start off with the second point first, then discrimination, and this is the critical really issue about the, the Palestinian three, um, the court, in an astonishingly um, compressed piece of reasoning for an issue of dramatic significance over the ages, in a few paragraphs, uh, Lord Justice Scott Baker really addresses the point, and he says that the objective of Article 9 was harmonisation, which suggested a narrow reading. Um, he also said that the phrase in particular, remember it said, um, so acts of persecution must be sufficiently serious, etc., in particular to be a breach of the non-derogable rights. He says that in particular um, must be exhaustive. It couldn't possibly mean, for example. And he makes one or two other points of, of semantic uh, import. A couple of things to say about that. Um, the Refugee Convention is primary law, as became increasingly clear throughout the period in which we were uh, party to, to, to the system. And uh, the Court of Justice, time and time again, announces that the you know, Refugee Convention is a primary law source. That is to say, it sees it as a constitutional instrument. So when we saw Mr Kerr deal with the uh, preamble to the Refugee Convention as a legal foundation for a rights-based, a broad rights-based approach to persecution, one might equally have taken the same approach as a matter of European Union law, treating the Refugee Convention preamble as part of the constitutional materials available to it. So query whether or not the right um, answer was got there, but also another, another query is that in particular, if we read the usage of the phrase in particular across the common European asylum system, procedures directive, reception directive, half the uses are in fact, for example, they patently are. They're not designed to delineate um, the, the be-all and end-all of an inquiry. I mean, for example, the Procedures Directive talks about relying on country evidence to specify, to identify safe countries, but it doesn't mention general human rights reports. But it refers to the whole bunch of sources in, as in particular. Um, the Reception Directive talks about the need to follow the Charter of Fundamental Rights, in particular, <laughs> Articles 2 and 18. But there's no way the reception directive intended to exclude the rest of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and play. And so, you know, one is always very slow to criticise judgment of the Court of Appeal. Um, but there is an issue, you know, there are issues about, about the cases of the Palestinian three. Before leaving that topic, um, a live issue on persecution which remains open, is the other half of those cases, the other aspect, the question of return. 
Now, the, the case law in the Refugee Convention is strong in that it, for, for nationals, people who hold nationality of a particular country of origin, if they're denied return, then that is persecution, the loss of the entire basket of rights by the denial. See Lazarevich and the line of authority thereafter. So the stateless do not get such a good deal. The cases of the Palestinian three are astute to note that you can't really complain about something you never had. And if you didn't have nationality rights in the first place, then why complain about their absence now? It's, you know, a, a continuation of a previous misfortune, but it's not um, an act of persecution. Well, it was pointed out in the advocacy in, in, the, in the cases of the Palestinian three that if you read the ICCPR, International Covenant on Political Rights, etc., um, at Article 12, it talks about rights to enter one's own country, and it points out that country here is broader than state in Article 12.4. Um, and therefore, it would seem that in some scenarios, that whilst nationals do have the strongest right to return, uh, for individuals who have close and enduring connections with particular territories... Uh, there's an argument. <laughs> there's an argument that they fall between the two extremes. That is to say, those with the uh, entitlements that some would assert for the Palestinian cause um, might not fall to be treated simply as bare stateless individuals. Anyway, that's an unresolved issue. The, the Court of Appeal took one look at it and said it was difficult, controversial, and too politically sensitive to resolve on the materials then available. Third moment: the protection of civilians in wartime and in both in times of national and international armed conflict. Two quotes from history, yeah, General Marius, uh, Roman warlord and first uh, individual to threaten the sanct sanctuary of the Roman Republic. He says famously, in the clash of arms the laws are silent and that is what he says when it's suggested that he should row in his troops from the worst of their excesses. In the, in the clash of arms, the laws are silent. Lord Atkin, in his landmark descent in the 1940s in Liversidge and Anderson, Lord Atkin says, the law is not silent in the clash of arms, which can only be an intentional reference to his uh, warlord predecessor. Um, so, but the truth is, I think that if you look at the response of international protection law over time to the plight of civilians caught up in armed conflict, the laws have often fallen silent and left something by way of a protection gap. And this uh, is, is even though often, you know, as acknowledged, for example, in KH Iraq, the plight of civilians caught up in armed conflict, and it's not getting any better, affronts our common humanity. So when the UK courts came to deal with this in the context of the civil war in Somalia in the early 90s, Lord Lloyd uh, and, his, uh, and the other judges found it very difficult to see a way into the Refugee Convention for these individuals. Uh, he said that, you know, it was obvious that um, civil wars were probably fought on on convention reason grounds, born of politics or religion or whatever. Um, but you needed something else, a differential impact over and above the ordinary risks of clan warfare, at least until one side achieves supremacy and persecuted the vanquished. And so... The case of Adan was the foundation for uh, a drawing back of potential international protection for the victims of civil war for some years. Adan is a case now that looks, and you know, the upper tribunals have said this in the past, it looks rather old-fashioned in AM and AM Somalia. Uh, a strong division of the upper tribunal noted that you know, the, the, it, it was showing its age, and it was very hard to imagine, given the general embrace of international humanitarian law by the English courts since Adam, that exactly the same decision would be made uh, were the case to be re-encountered by a Supreme Court in this country. And Adam received criticism around the world. The New Zealand courts were critical of it. The Ibrahim Court, in the High Court in Australia, uh, said the, the text rationale and purposes of the convention did not justify the Adam conclusions. Um, the House of Lords relied on academic commentary from Professor, Professor Hathaway. But if one reads that commentary, it appears to be lesser embrace or analysis of the present system and just a description of a state of affairs that was by no means perfect. And when Hathaway and his uh, colleagues, leading academics from around the world, revisited the issue shortly after Adam, they produced the Michigan Guidelines on Convention Nexus and said no special rule governs the causal nexus standard in the case of war or other large-scale violence or oppression. 
In reality, of course, the heat was taken out of the uh, Civil War pressure cooker because of the arrival of Article 15C of the Qualification Directive, which vested subsidiary protection on those who might otherwise have got refugee status. And of course, at least for so long as the rights were identical, <laughs> of course, they no longer are in the United Kingdom, uh, but as long as they were identical, no one really cared what form of international protection they received. And uh, Article 15C is, is put in these terms. Um, serious subsidiary protection will follow if there is a serious and individual threat to a civilian's life or person by reason of indiscriminate violence in situations of international or internal armed conflict. You know, quite a piling up of words. Lord Justice Sedley remarked upon it when the case reached the Court of Appeal in QD, Iraq. He pointed out that there were a whole series of contradictions implicit in that text. The most obvious one is the requirement of an individual threat arising from indiscriminate violence. And no doubt, you know, the reason why um, that phrase was, was you know, put into the qualification directive was that member states could not agree. They could not agree on the uh, full embrace of the victims of armed conflict as something that went beyond executive discretion and could receive status as of legal right. And so they inserted words to sabotage the original intent of uh, the European Union Commission. A number of courts have looked at Article 15C. Uh, KH Iraq is the most creative approach where the UK's tribunal, uh, in a massive piece of, of, of impressive scholarship, um, sought to demonstrate that you could best give life to Article 15C as a way of expanding civilian protection beyond what you would get from Article 3 ECHR. They said you could achieve that expansion best if you incorporated international humanitarian law into the, refi into, uh, the qualification directive. Um, they said that was legitimate because the preambles to the qualification directive draw on state practice and international humanitarian law is indubitably a piece of state practice. Um, and they also suggested that that phrase, uh, threat to a life of person, life of life, threat to life and threats to a civilian's life or person, when read with the introductory phrase, which required a real risk of a threat to a civilian's life or person, demonstrated that there was a lesser form of harm envisaged by this provision than might be the case, for example, with Article 3 ECHR. Mike Fordham, as he then was, um, was, to, was, was, was to say in his submissions in one of the later 15C cases, it was designed to protect civilians who lived under the shadow of violence. Sadly, um, well, for, all, you know, for, for all the efforts of the tribunal in KH Iraq, which you know, was a, a problematic decision in some ways, no doubt, um, it didn't survive the uh, gaze of the Court of Appeal when it, went, when it went onwards, and the Court of Appeal said that IHL had no real role to play in the qualification directive protection regime. Uh, they said that regime had to stand on its own two legs um, and it couldn't, you know, could not incorporate other legal regimes. And, and since then, the law has struggled, the judges have struggled to find any meaningful role for Article 15C qualification directive that would not simply have been found in good old Article 3 ECHR. Um, yeah, OK, good. Right, let's move on to the fourth moment. Fourth moment is departure from the European Union and the process of deharmonisation with European Union law. So we've already seen some features of the qualification directive over the last few minutes. Uh, in some ways, the qualification directive is the high point, the high point of the humanitarian initiatives in favour of refugees. It was a, you know, a rare opportunity for a supranational institution the European Union Commission and the rest of the EU's legislature, to look at the processes and practices around the world, achieve, adopt many of the best ones, um, and you know, give life to something that you know, would, would never otherwise have existed. Now, it's true, of course, <laughs> not every directive that formed part of the common European asylum system uh, necessarily had that motivation. But the qualification directive, you know, I would suggest, probably represents the high point in terms of you know, the protection given to refugees in many ways. Also, of course, you only have to look at it to realise that it was, it, much of it was crystallised UK case law. Um, the, the, all the stuff on social group, political opinion, state protection, 
even internal relocation could have been taken straight from you know the decisions in extant UK case law in the early 2000s. And now, of course, you know we're going to enter an era, an interesting and difficult era, uh, where we depart, you know, from the shadow of the Court of Justice. Eleanor Sharpston, former UK Advocate General to the Court of Justice, um, says that taking uh, you know, to taking legal provisions out of the Court of Justice's regime is like taking a delicate plant out of the soil that nourishes it. She says that inevitably, you know, it, will, it won't flourish, it will die uh, in, in that scenario. Well, we will see. We will see what the richness of the common law, no doubt, has to say about that. But there is obviously an issue that we no longer, you know, that these provisions, which, which have been now, you know, uh, de-retained <laughs> by moving them from EU-retained law into the sections of the 22 Act, as happened last June, we will have to see how they are to be interpreted. One point on interpretation, though, is the Court of Justice of the European Union takes a distinctive approach to looking at um, the Refugee Convention. As I've already touched on, it increasingly, yeah, it, it, it awarded it increasing normative intensity as time went on. It gave more and more weight to um, the, the value of the Refugee Convention itself. As I say, it saw it as a constitutional document time and time again. It calls it primary law. It also looks at the compatibility, well, in, at least in cases of ambiguity, of the Qualification Directive with the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights. It also has other quirks, such as the fact it searches for the best, you know, it searches for the most um, shared meaning between the different language versions where there is some difference between them. Um, and other quirks are that a member state, it seems, could actually be liable to an interpretation born of directives which it hadn't signed up to uh, when interpreting a directive which it had signed up to. So the Court of Justice um, is a court that has a very distinct interpretive approach. So to give an example, let us take the concept of protection, the concept of state protection. And obviously, I'm about to talk about Brexit law, and that comes to the health warning that these are choppy waters in which to sail. And you know, as, as happened perhaps to the Supreme Court in G&G &G not so long ago, uh, it's easy to capsize in those waters. But anyway, this is my best effort to explain um, the, the, the approach to European Union law, which, which still matters, because there's a significant period where this EU retained law uh, was still on the statute book. And what, 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 so what is the right approach? Let's take a concept like protection. So obviously protection before October 2006 was governed by the case law of Horvath. Horvath basically said that protection did not have to be effective. The whole point of the ruling in Horvath was that the tribunal had effectively found that Mr Horvath and his Slovakian peers faced a real risk of persecution of being beaten up, a real risk of being beaten up at the hands of uh, skinheads and their uniformed accomplices. Um, but the court in Horvath managed to say that that wasn't enough to achieve refugee status because you also had to show that there was no machinery, no adequate machinery in place to diminish the risks you faced. Now, when the qualification directive came out of the legal laboratories in, um, uh, in Brussels, uh, they injected some humanity into that and they said they, they took the Horvath test the requirement for a working machinery of justice but they added to it the requirement that it be both effective and accessible you know an example of the positive uh, you know work that the commission did in developing the qualification directive so they achieved that little humanitarian flourish um, so that's the test that we had, and that's the test that we had you know, right up until um, June 2022, effectively. However, once uh, Brexit happened and the implementation period ended, i.e. 31st of December, 11pm, 2020, the, um, the regime changed because there was then a period where we had the 2006 protection regulations which gave the same definition, the very same definition of protection, which I've just mentioned, as in the Qualification Directive, protection has to be effective and accessible. Same definition. Now, for case law, for Court of Justice case law that was decided pre-December 2020, it would be binding in interpreting those provisions. And if it was decided post-December uh, 2020, then it was merely a matter to which you may have regard as a judge. Um, 
the individual promoting that legislation, Mr Raab, Government Minister, as he then was, um, he, Mr Raab promoting that legislation said there was no wish to fossilise Court of Justice decision making um, and he wanted judges to have it, uh, real English judges to have an opportunity to revolutionise it whenever required. The, the um, orders, the parliamentary orders in section 6 of the 2018 Act that address the approach to be taken to retain EU law basically say that court should, the higher courts should depart from it when they consider it right to do so. And as Professor Feldman at Cambridge remarked, that didn't really help very much because presumably, whatever else you might do, you wouldn't depart from a case if you thought it was wrong to depart from it. And so telling you you used to do so if it was right to depart from it didn't give an enormous amount of legal content. Um, just to give an example of this, so in January 2021, so right on the cusp of, of the implementation period finishing, but as after it finished, the, the Court of Justice in OA Somalia come up with a decision on clans, Somali clans, and the English court for some years had said that uh, clans could provide protection against persecution. But the Court of Justice said that the social and financial support provided by private actors, be they family or clan, could not suffice because it would not pass the requirements for state protection in the qualification directive. So that decision would, from uh, December, January 2021 until June 2022, have been a matter to which regard should have been had. Of course, now since June 2022, we have firmly repatriated uh, refugee law and the other sequelae of the qualification directive, like humanitarian protection. We repatriate, rep repatriated it largely into the 2022 Nationality and Borders Act. And so the question arises, what approach is to be taken by the English courts to um, Court of Justice authorities, which are considering exactly the same text, the internal relocation text, the social group test, the um, state protection test here. Yeah? It's all verbatim the same between the 22 Act and the qualification directive. What approach is the, are the English courts to take to that? Legal certainty is a you know, significant principle in English law. The US Supreme Court talks about the cement of legal principle. Um, Alan Patterson, in his book, The Law Lords, talks, says that the reality is that over the last 30 or 40 years, the House of Lords has departed from its own decisions, um, or it avoided departing from them, where legitimate expectations should not be upset where people had arranged their affairs relying on extant law. Um, departure should be reserved for circumstances where great uncertainty has been caused by the existing pronouncements of the court. Well, <laughs> given the Delphic pronouncements of the Court of Justice, I suppose you might uh, pass that test with some ease. Anyway, they say the past is a foreign country, so there's a real live question, though, to what extent we have left uh, the foreign country, which is the European Union, and for how long uh, the Court of Justice's shadow will cast over us. My final topic, then, briefly, um, and that is current affairs. Current affairs. So, 70 years' worth of, uh, you know, at least in form, respect for most of the norms within the Refugee Convention is presently jeopardised, some critics say, um, by legislation sp speedily going through uh, the Parliament at present, and in so doing, you know, destroy damaging protections with the speed of parchment going up in a flame. Um, and so what does the statute do? This isn't a CPD course about the interstices of what the new legislation says and goodness knows how much it will change before it passes. But in short, the, 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 the most interesting provisions for present purposes are the provisions which put um, asylum claims on hold. And the idea is that um, anyone who's arrived in the UK from 7th of March 2023 who didn't come here directly, i.e. passed through or stopped in another country where their life or liberty is not threatened, their um, claims will be rendered inadmissible and that will be the case uh, whether or not they make a protection claim, a modern slavery claim, a human rights claim and whether or not they receive uh, a, a decision on a judicial review and there are fairly complicated provisions about how all that is to be dealt with going forwards. UNHR um, obviously the best commentator to go to on this point. Um, they say, 
By seeking to close its borders to people fleeing persecution and to require them to seek protection elsewhere, the UK would be retreating from the principles of international cooperation on which the global refugee system is based and acting inconsistently with the object and purpose of the Refugee Convention, imposing an even more disproportionate responsibility on those countries, as well as others through which refugees may travel, uh, and which are closest to refugee-producing zones, and threaten the capacity and willingness of those countries in turn to provide protection and long-term solutions. It is when hosting capacity is overwhelmed that onward movement often ensues. The majority of those claiming asylum will be left in indefinite limbo, limbo while the government seeks arrangements with third countries for removal, for which there are currently no viable arrangements in place. The strain on housing, medical care and schools will increase rather than diminish. The bill all but extinguishes the right to claim asylum in the UK. 96% of refugees, asylum seeking and others in need, come from the 108 countries whose nationals require entry clearance to come to the UK. This is a rejection of the principles of international cooperation on which refugee law is founded. It would be inconsistent with the right to seek and enjoy asylum, a basic human right under Article 14.1 of the UDHR. So, no doubt about what side of the fence UNHR are on in this um, debate. So, you know, given, given the points they might make, objective bystanders might question the wisdom of, of the legislation. Henry VIII is on record as saying, when presented with a particularly obscure writ by his legal advisers, I know it is law, for my lawyers so tell me, but my reason digesteth it not. Perhaps that observation might be made of some critics of the um, proposed legislation at the moment. Obviously, there are problems with it, uh, such as those which UNHCR uh, identifies so clearly. Um, but also, you know, Lord Bingham, when Lord Bingham writes his book, The Rule of Law, uh, he says that key features of the rule of law, uh, rights and liability being resolved by law rather than discretion, uh, and equality of application of the law absent any objective justification. And obviously lifting the protection of the law in the way that's being proposed from a class of individuals, for example, by depriving them of the um, full access to judicial review, is a, you know, a distinct uh, step to take which has to be thought, of, thought about carefully. Are there any legal norms that might stand in the way of these measures? And here we find ourselves casting around somewhat, because you know the UK, of course, is a dualist country. We only, um, you know, we, we we don't incorporate conventions into our national law merely by signing up to them. You know, we have to have the additional step of fully incorporating them. Um, to some extent, you know, that, that, that has been done in a particular way, by the you know, a sophisticated way, vis-à-vis -vis the European Convention on Human Rights. It hasn't been done at all with the Statelessness Convention. Um, it was sort of done, but rode back on quite recently for the Trafficking Convention. And vis-à-vis -vis the Refugee Convention, well, all we really have is the statement that the immigration rule should not be inconsistent with uh, anything in the Refugee Convention. But obviously, the whole point of putting this stuff on the statute book rather than in the form of rules is to um, em emphasise the sovereignty of Parliament. The preamble to the Refugee Convention says that considering that the Charter of the UN and the UN UDHR have affirmed the principles that human beings will enjoy fundamental rights and freedoms without discrimination, the UN has manifested its profound concern for refugees. So, you know, the preamble obviously is a potential source of law, but, it, but it, it, it isn't incorporated into the English system. So John Laws famously did rely on the preamble, at least to back up his existing thinking in Seppard and Bulbul, when he said that um, taking a narrow approach to military service evaders would confine the scope of convention protection in a straight tack jacket so tight as to mock the words of the recital, the very recital that I just read out. But the truth was, he was already um, home and dry on more classic legal norms. The principle of good faith, you know, UNHR would probably have it that um, the approach of the UK government proposed in the current legislation is not necessarily um, fully in good faith. And the Vienna Convention, Article 26, Pact zum Savander, um, says that treaties shall be performed and interpreted in good faith. But again, as the English courts have been very clear, Brown and Stott, Roma writes, um, there's nothing to stop a party interpreting a treaty as meaning what it says and declining to go any further. States have been adamant in maintaining the question of entry, in particular entry of foreign nationals, uh, is something which falls to each nation to resolve for itself. International Court of Justice says in the Nicaragua case uh, that um, 
the good faith principle is not of itself a source of obligation when none would, none would otherwise exist. So it is a very difficult situation. Of course, there are other legal norms in the Human Rights Convention and so forth that may mean that leaving uh, refugees or alleged refugees in limbo, Dante's first circle of hell, for an extended period, uh, you know, may be rights violative, and it may well be that actions are brought, you know, can be brought on that score. But it's really quite difficult to see what it is in the Refugee Convention that would, you know, well, as as operative in a dualist system like the United Kingdom, uh, that would prevent the measures, so uh, hopefully those pessimistic comments will be proved wrong. Now, I was hoping, I was hoping to find um, a, positive, a positive note to finish on, because most of this has been negative. Here's my positive note. <laughs> so, a quotation much loved by Barack Obama, who actually changed it to make it more digestible to the American market, I think, uh, but originally for Martin Luther King. It is said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And so we might hope, we might hope that, that uh, the, unit, the common sense advanced by UNHCR will prevail. And who knows that the experiments that we're seeing in the asylum laboratory that is the United Kingdom at the moment um, won't all come to pass or will be attempted and in due course abandoned. Thank you very much.